Clairvoyance and Occult Powers by William Walker Atkinson, read by Anonymous Traveler for Intellectual Exercise. Lesson 2. Telepathy versus Clairvoyance. In this work, I shall use the term clairvoyance in its broad sense of astral perception, as distinguished from perception by means of the physical senses. As we proceed, you will see the general and the special meanings of the term, so there is no necessity for a special definition or illustration of the term at this time. By telepathy, I mean the sending and the receiving of thought messages and the mental and the emotional state consciously or unconsciously by means of what may be called the sixth sense of the physical plane. There is, of course, a form of thought transference on the astral plane, but this I include under the general term of clairvoyance for reasons which will be explained later on. You will remember that in the preceding chapter, I told you that in addition to the five ordinary physical senses of man, there were also two other physical senses comparatively undeveloped in the average person. These two extra physical senses are, respectively, number one, the sense of the presence of other living things, and number two, the telepathic sense. As I also told you, these two extra physical senses have their astral counterpart. They also have certain physical organs which are not generally recognized by physiologists or psychologists, but which are well known to all occultists. I shall now consider the first of the two above-mentioned extra physical senses in order to clear the way for our consideration of the question of the distinction between ordinary telepathy and that form of clairvoyance which is its astral counterpart. There is in every human being a sense which is not generally recognized as such, although nearly every person has had more or less experience regarding its workings. I refer to the senses of the presence of other living things separate and apart from the operation of any of the five ordinary physical senses. I ask you to understand that I am not claiming that this is a higher sense than the other physical senses or that it has come to man in a high state of evolution. On the contrary, this sense came to living things far back in the scale of evolution. It is possessed by the higher forms of the lower animals, such as the horse, dog, and the majority of the wild beast. Savage and barbaric men have been more highly developed than it is in the case of the civilized man. In fact, this physical sense may be termed almost vestigial in civilized man because he has not actively used it for many generations. For that matter, the physical sense of a smell is also deficient in man and for the same reason, whereas in the case of the lower animals and the savage man, 
the sense of smell is very keen. I mention this for fear of misunderstanding. In my little book, The Astral World, I have said, all occultists know that man really has seven senses instead of merely five, though the additional two senses are not sufficiently developed for use in the average person. Some have taken this to mean that the occultist develops these two extra physical senses just as he does certain higher psychic or astral faculties. But this is wrong. The occultist, in such case, merely reawakens these two senses which have been almost lost to the human race. By use and exercise, he then develops them to a wonderful proficiency for use on the physical plane. Now, this sense of the presence of other living beings is very well developed in the lower animals, particularly in those whose safety depend upon the knowledge of the presence of their natural enemies. As might be expected, the wild animals have been more highly developed than do the domesticated animals. But even among the latter, we find instances of this sense being in active use. In the case of dogs, horses, geese, etc. Who of us is not familiar with the strange actions of the dog or the horse when the animal senses the unseen and unheard presence of some person or animal? Very often, we would scold or punish the animal for its peculiar actions simply because we are not able to see what is worrying it. How often does the dog start suddenly and bristle up its hair when nothing is in sight or within hearing distance? How often does the horse grow skittish or even panicky when there is nothing within sight or hearing. Domestic fowls, especially geese, manifest an uneasiness at the presence of strange persons or animals, though they may not be able to see or hear them. It is a matter of history that this sense in a flock of geese once saved ancient Rome from an attack of the enemy. The night was dark and stormy, and the trained eyesight and the keen hearing of the Roman outpost failed to reveal the approach of the enemy. But the keen sense of the geese felt the presence of a strange man and they started to cackle loudly, aroused the guard, and Rome was saved. Skeptical persons have sought to explain this historical case by the theory that the geese heard the approaching enemy. But this explanation will not serve, for the Roman soldiers were marching about on their post and guard duty and the geese remained silent until they sensed the approach of the small number of the enemy scout when they burst into wild cries. The ancient Romans themselves were under no illusion about the matter. They recognized the existence of some unusual power in the geese and they gave the animals the full credit Therefore, hunters in wild and strange land have told us that often 
When they were lying concealed for the purpose of shooting the wild animals, when they came within range, they have witnessed instances of the existence of this strange faculty in the wild beast. Though they could not see the concealed hunters, nor smell them, all of a sudden, one or more of the animals would start suddenly, and a shiver would be seen to pass over its body. Then it would utter a low warning note, and away would fly the pack. Nearly every hunter has had the experience of watching his expected game, when all of a sudden, it would start off with a nervous jerk and without waiting to sniff the air, as is usual, would bolt suddenly from the scene. Moreover, many beasts of prey are known to sense the presence of their natural prey. Certain birds seem to sense the presence of particular worms upon which they feed, though the latter be buried several inches in the earth or in the bark of trees. Savage man also has this faculty developed, as all travelers and explorers well know. They are as keen as a wild animal to sense the nearness of enemies, or in some cases, the approach of a man-eating beast. This does not mean that, that these savages are more highly developed than is civilized man. Quite the reverse. This is the explanation. When man became more civilized and made himself more safe from his wild beast enemies, as well as from the sudden attacks of his human enemies, he began to use this sense less and less. Finally, in the course of many generations, it became almost atrophied from disuse, and ceased reporting to the brain or other nerve centers, or, if you prefer, viewing it from other anger, it may be said that the nerve centers and the brain began to pay less and less attention to the report of this sense until the consciousness failed to awaken to the report. You know how your consciousness will finally refuse to be awakened by familiar sound, although the ears receive the sound waves. Well, this is the way in the case of this neglected sense. For the two reasons just mentioned, the average person is almost unaware of its existence. Almost unaware, I have said, not totally unaware. For probably, every one of us has had experiences in which we have actually felt the presence of some strange person about the premises or place. The effect of the report of this sense is particularly noticed in the region of the solar plexus or the pit of the stomach. It manifests in a peculiar, unpleasant feeling of the goneness in that region it produces a feeling of something wrong, which disturbs one in a strange way. It is a most unpleasant feeling, and the race escapes much discomfort by reason of its comparative absence. I have said that occultists have developed, or rather, redeveloped this sense. They do this in order to have a harmonious, well-developed sevenfold sense system, 
it increases their general awareness. Certain other knowledge of the occultist neutralized the unpleasant features of the manifestation of this sense, and he find it often a very valuable adjunct to his senses of seeing and hearing, particularly in the cases in which he is approached by persons having hostile feelings toward him. As in such cases, this faculty is particularly active. In connection with the telepathic sense, this sense operates to give a person the sense of a warning when approached by another person whose feelings are not friendly to him, no matter how friendly the outward appearance of that person may be. These two extra senses cooperate to give a person that instinctive feeling of a warning which all of us know in our own experience. This particular as well as the telepathic sense may be cultivated or developed by anyone who wishes to take the time and trouble to accomplish the work. The principle is simple, merely the same principle that one uses in developing any of the other physical attributes, namely use and exercise. The first step is the recognition of the existence of the sense itself. Then the second step is the attention given to its report. Then the third step is frequent use and exercise. Just think of how you would proceed to develop any of the five ordinary senses, the hearing, sight, or touch, for instance. Then follow the same process in the cultivation of this extra scent or two senses, and you will accomplish the same kind of result. Now, let us consider the other extra physical sense, the telepathic sense, or sense of becoming aware of the thought waves or emotional waves of other persons. Now, as strange as this may appear to some persons, this telepathy faculty is not a higher faculty or sense, but is really a comparatively low one. Just like the sense just described, it is possessed in a higher degree by many of the lower animals and by savage men that which really is higher in this kind of a psychic phenomena is the manifestation of that higher form of a telepathy by use of the astral counterpart of this sense which we shall consider later under the name of a clairvoyance for this is really a particular phase of a clairvoyance. As strange as it may appear to some of you, the lower animals possess a kind of a telepathic sense. An animal is usually aware of your feelings toward it and your intention regarding it. Domestic animals lose some of this by generations of confinement, while the wild animals have the same highly developed, but even some of the domestic animals have more or less of it. You will readily recognize this fact if you have ever tried to cut out a certain animal from a herd or a flock. You will find that the animal in some way has sensed your intention upon it no matter how indirectly you approach it, and it will begin circling around the other animals, twisting in and out, trying to be lost to your sight. The other animals, likewise, 
we'll seem to know that you are after only that particular one and will manifest a little fright or distrust. I have frequently seen this thing in my own country and in others among poultry raisers. The poultry man will think to himself, now, I'm going to get that black hen with the yellow legs, that fat, clumsy one. And he will move toward the frog slowly and with an air of unconcern. But as soon as he gets near the creatures, that black hen will be seen edging her way to the outer circle of the flock on the opposite side from the man. When the man moves around to her side, she will be found to have plunged into the crowd, and it is hard to find her. Sometimes she will actually try to sneak off and conceal herself in some dark corner or back of some large object. Every poultry man will smile when this occurrence is mentioned to him. He knows by experience that hands have a way of sensing what he has in his mind regarding them. Moreover, as every farmer knows, the crow family has a most uncanny way of sensing the intentions of the farmer who is trying to destroy them and shows great sagacity in defeating those intentions. But while the crow is a very intelligent bird, it obtains its knowledge of what is in the mind of the man not alone from figuring on his intentions, but rather from that instinctive sensing of his mental state. The hen as all know, is a very stupid bird, showing but little intelligent activity. But nevertheless, she is very quick about sensing the poultry man's intentions on her, though generally very stupid about planning out a skillful escape. Every owner of dogs, cats, and horses has had many opportunities for observing the manifestation of this sense on the part of those animals. Every dog feels the emotional state of his owner and the others. The horse knows when his owner seeks to throw the halter over his neck, or when, on the contrary, he is merely working through the field. Cats sense their owner's feelings and those as well. Of course, the lower animals can sense merely elementary mental state and generally only emotional state as their minds are not developed so as to interpret the more complex mental state. Savage men, likewise, almost instinctively sense the feeling and the intentions of other men. They do not reason the thing out, but rather merely feel the ideas and the intentions of the others. The women of the savage groups are more adept in interpreting these sense reports than are the men. Women are more sensitive, as a rule, than are men on any point on the scale of development. When we come to consider ordinary telepathy, in the case of men of civilized countries, we find a more complex state of affairs. While civilized man, as a whole, has lost some of the quick telepathic perception of the savage groups, he has, in some exceptional cases, acquired a faculty of receiving and uh, interpreting more complex thought forms and the uh, mental state. The investigations of the Society for Psychical Research 
and those of private investigators as well, have shown us that a picture of a complicated geometrical design held in the mind of one person may be carried to and received by the mind of another person who reproduces the design on paper in the same way complicated thus have transmitted and received. But these are only exceptional cases. In many cases, this sense seems almost dead in the ordinary civilized individual except when aroused in exceptional cases. But, nevertheless, the majority of persons have occasional flashes of a telepathy, just enough to make them realize that there is something in it. The renewed interest in the subject of late years has directed the public mind to the phenomenon of a telepathy and consequently, more persons are now taking note of the cases of thought transference coming under their personal notice. It must be remembered, of course, that all of us are constantly receiving thought waves, unconsciously. I am speaking now only of the conscious perception of the thought waves. Many investigators have so developed their telepathic sense that they are able, at times, to obtain wonderful test results. But it has been a source of disappointment to many of them to discover that at other times, under apparently similar conditions, their success was very slight. So true is this that many authorities have accepted the theory that the telepathy is more or less spontaneous and cannot be produced to order. This theory is true as far as it goes, but there is a side of the case that these investigators overlook, probably because of their lack of the occult principles involved in phenomena. I mean this, that their most brilliant successes have been obtained by reason of their unconscious switching on of the astral telepathic sense, the clairvoyance sense. While in this condition, they obtained a startling result, but the next time they tried, they failed to awaken the astral sense and therefore had to depend entirely upon the physical telepathic sense and consequently their results were comparatively poor. You will understand the difference and the distinction between physical sense telepathy and astral sense telepathy. If you will carefully consider the nature of each as I shall now present it to you, I ask your close attention to what I shall have to say on this subject in the remaining pages of this chapter. Do not pass over these explanations as dry, for unless you have a clear fundamental understanding of the thing, you will never be able to get the best result. This is true of every phase of learning, physical as well as psychical, one must get started right in order to obtain the best result. In the first place, every thought process, every emotional activity, every creation of ideas is accompanied by a manifestation of a force, in fact, is the result of the manifestation of a force. Without entering at all into the question of what mind is in itself, we may rest firmly on the natural fact that every manifestation of mental or emotional activity 
is the result of an action of the brain or nervous system manifesting in a form of vibrations. Just as in the case of the manifestation of electricity, in which certain chemical elements are consumed or transformed, so in the case of a mental or emotional activity, there is a consuming or transformation of the substance of which the nervous system is composed. When I say nervous system, in this connection, I include the brain or brains of a man, for these are but a part of his great nervous system in which all emotional or mental activity is manifested. Moreover, just as there is no real destruction of matter in any of nature's process, so in the case before us, there is a transformation of the energy released in the thought or emotional process. We may grasp this idea more clearly if we consider what takes place into transformation of electric energy. For instance, transmit a strong current of electricity over a fine wire or filament of a carbon and the current is transformed into light. Use another kind of a channel of a transmission and the current is transformed into heat. Every electric light or electric heating apparatus is proof of this. In the same way, the electric current is sent into space in the form of wireless waves. These waves coming in contact with certain forms of apparatus are transformed into forms of force which are registered and interpreted by the wireless operator. In the same way, the telepathic waves of energy are sent forth by the activity released by the thoughts or emotional state. These waves travel in every direction and when they come in contact with the physical apparatus sufficiently sensitive to register them, they may be reproduced or retransformed into thought or mental state similar to those which originally sent them forth. You talk into the receiver of the telephone and the sound waves are transformed into waves of electricity. These electric waves travel over the wires and on reaching the other end of the telephone circuit are again transformed into sound waves which are heard by the ear of the listener. Well then, when your brain send out thought waves, these travel until they are received by the apparatus in the brain of another person when they are re-transformed into thought of the same kind that originally caused the thought waves. I will have much more to say on this subject in the next chapter. I will pause here to point out the difference between the phenomena of this form of telepathy and the higher form which is really a phase of clairvoyance. Now, in the case of what may be called a clairvoyant telepathy or astral telepathy, the ordinary thought waves play for a small part. Instead of this, there is a transmission of a force along the channel of the astral plane. It is almost impossible to describe the phenomena of the astral plane in the terms of the physical. I may illustrate the matter 
in a general way by saying that it's something like your astral self actually extending itself out until it touches the astral self of the other person and thus actually feels the astral activities there instead of it being a case of something like waves traveling along space between brain and brain. Do you get this clearly? This is about as near to it as I can explain at this place. Telepathy is simply a matter of the transmission and the receiving of waves of a vibrational force which have traveled along the ether between two persons. But clairvoyance or astral telepathy is something like your mind being extended out until it actually touches the mind of the other person and sees what is there. I shall have much to say regarding the working out of the processes of clairvoyance as we proceed. I have merely given the above explanation for the purpose of distinguishing between ordinary telepathy and clairvoyance so as to prevent you from falling into a common error. Now, let us consider in the phenomena of ordinary telepathy. This is very wonderful in itself, although it is on a lower plane of activity than its astral or clairvoyant counterpart. End of lesson 2